All right. Well, today we're very pleased to have Justin Curry talking to us about algebraic and geometric models for space networking. Let's take it away, Justin. Great. And thank you for the introduction, David. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here virtually at the Topos Institute. Um, I had thought about building out a set of slides where I just hit everybody over the head with a lot of category theory. Um, but I decided maybe I'd focus on the higher level details, uh, giving this talk as I would to um, to engineers, um, and then maybe add a few few comments about some of the abstract math foundations uh, that, that I think are under the hood here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So just to provide some context, um, I'm gonna be interested in new models for space internet. Um, and we're in a really lucky position because we're in a, in a situation where we can look historically at how internet on earth developed and try to take away what lessons we can from that and also see what are the important differences as we move to a solar system wide internet. So in case you didn't know, and maybe you weren't alive back then, I certainly wasn't. Um, back in 1969, so about 53 years ago, um, the internet, as we know, it consisted of about four nodes. Um, and the ability to get these computers to talk to each other was considered a really significant accomplishment. Um, machines like the PDB-10 or Sigma-7, they had really fundamentally different computer architectures. And so like taking messages that were really meant to be parsed and understood by a completely different system and sending that over wires so that it could then be received and then decoded um, into, into a message that the receiving system uh, would understand was, was really considered an accomplishment. Uh, now, this was only two years after a vision paper by Lawrence Roberts outlined uh, how they wanted ARPANET to look over the next uh, several years. So in 1967, there was already the sketch of the idea that major research centers um, between Southern California, Northern California, Utah, Illinois, um, and the Northeast would all be connected uh, and have the ability to talk to each other. Um, so a few years after that paper, you can see that the reality actually was, was keeping up with that vision. Um, and so by 72, we had about two dozen nodes on the internet. Um, and by another five years after that, we can see we're now on the order of dozens, low hundreds of, of nodes, um, all talking to each other across these different machines. And around 2005, that's when we finally broke the, uh, the billion uh, computer mark. Um, and at that, this point, some of the phenomena of the internet viewed as it being really a network of networks started uh, uh, come, to, come to light. And so in this visualization here, you're looking at about 30% of all nodes on the internet. And, and if you kind of zoom in a little bit here, you can see this sort of local star topology um, for organizing these networks uh, really came to be. And, and that star topology also allowed us to get at these sort of deeper principles of like, how do we effectively address and route machines across the uh, route between machines across this network? Um, you know, really the fact that terrestrial internet is this sort of network of networks where maybe locally they end up looking like trees um, means that your addressing system kind of lends itself to a, a tree-like hierarchy. So, you know, this the fact that we have an IAP address where, you know, the first few digits are fixed uh, amongst uh, common ancestors, but then as you have to go higher and higher up in the network, that's when you start changing those values. Um, so the actual like network topology ended up uh, being reflected in the sort of name topology for how you address and route between these machines. Um, so I just mentioned this because I want you to think about what the analog of an IP address would look like for, for let's say, a time-evolving system and how that affects the topology on your namespace. Um, but, you know, as everyone here is aware, all these early lessons and how the internet developed has had this huge explosion over the, over the past 50 years. Um, and, and here we can already see that around 2008, with the introduction of the iPhone, uh, the number of nodes on this system really started to, to take off. Um, and so nowadays we have well over 5 billion uh, nodes on the internet. And again, this growth, um, what I'm showing here is really just over the course of about 30 years. So 
So let's let's take all of these sort of historical lessons in mind as as we move to uh, to space internet. So, just to provide like a good case study for what does uh, space internet look like now, um, one of our best systems for studying it is actually uh, coming from studying subsamples of uh, Starlink. Um, and here I've got a simulation of 80 nodes from Starlink uh, that are evolving uh, over the course of about a day, maybe sped up slightly here. Um, I'll play that again so you can take a closer look. And so one thing to keep in mind is that the, the network topology that's connecting these nodes really is uh, quickly changing. I mean, there are some sort of slow moving assets like our planets and, and star, um, which sort of relatively are slow changing, but but the actual mechanics of having satellites talking, which are essentially moving around the earth and orbits around every 90 minutes, uh, means that the available links for communication are really, really uh, rapidly changing. So already you can try to ask yourself, what would it be like to try to route between two nodes on a system like this? And how would you do it effectively? Just for a slightly different view, let's take now 100 Starlink nodes and look at its evolution um, in this sort of 3D spherical geometry. So again, you, you can see how each of these satellites are moving very quickly. The possible angles um, for communication are all determined essentially by line of sight. Um, but even then, the, the sort of topology of who is able to see or talk to whom is rapidly changing. Okay. So we're going to use these as sort of case studies. Um, this is sort of a local system. We, we think of this as a near-Earth internet. It's essentially directly in orbit. Um, but we're also interested in what happens when we're trying to network with satellites or rovers, which are, let's say, uh, around the moon, um, which is again, right at this sort of dividing point between near earth and, and sort of deep space internet. Um, and then Mars, which is of course, uh, where we're hoping to uh, go and build up our presence. Uh, I should mention that a lot of this work I'm talking about is has been funded in part because uh, Artemis is supposed to make a reappearance on the moon in, in 2024. Uh, which is really viewed as sort of a, a test run uh, for longer human based miss uh, missions to Mars. Now, as I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, my contacts at NASA, I can try to summarize the central challenge that we're looking at here for space networking is we want to develop a scalable autonomous routing protocol uh, for solar system wide internet. Now, just to highlight this issue of scale and autonomy, uh, based on my conversations with engineers at NASA, the way that data delivery is currently handled, let's say from like the Perseverance or, or Curiosity rover on Mars, is literally hundreds of engineers have to agree on a schedule that, let's say the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is going to be not collecting data from another source they're gonna maintain their channels open for communication um, for whatever data is being transmitted from the surface. That then has to be relayed to another node. And each one of those data handoffs are essentially hand scheduled by teams of engineers. I mean, obviously this is extremely expensive, important data, um, but the goal is as the number of assets scale in the uh, soon, uh, in the in near future, um, we want to be able to automate this process and, and ensure certain features like reliable, reliable delivery. Um, but at, at a really fundamental level, I'd say there are sort of three main aspects of this challenge, which I want to talk to you uh, today. So the first and foremost is that our networks are not static. Um, they're time varying networks. And so trying to understand really what is a time varying network is going to be one of my first entry points into this problem. Second aspect is how do you communicate when each relay of information uh, has to travel at the speed of light, but here the speed of light accumulates um, uh, to serious time across, across the network. Um, just for context, I mean, communicating to the moon, it's not so bad. It's about a 1.5 second uh, one-way uh, trip. 
But depending on where uh, Mars and, and the Earth are and their relative orbits, uh, we're looking at anywhere, I think, between uh, 3 and 22 minutes for one-way light uh, travel between Earth and Mars uh, with like maybe 10 minutes or 8 minutes as a good average. And then finally, I want to try to understand in the context of time varying networks where there's this non-trivial propagation delay, what does it mean for the internet to be a network of networks in this setting? So how can we glue together different network topologies? All right, and so with, with these three sort of uh, signposts, I want to go ahead and start with the, the first point, which is what really is a time varying graph? Okay, so if you talk to... Um, an engineer at Twitter or even many uh, mathematicians, uh, if you ask them what's a time varying graph, one of the things they'll, they'll first say to you is like, well, a time varying graph is, is a graph sequence. So it's a, uh, a collection of graphs, which is sort of indexed by some counter variable. Uh, we can think of that index as being like the timestamp or, or snapshot at which you're viewing a network. But very often you can just literally think of it as something that's indexed by the natural numbers. Uh, now, this perspective, I think, has, has some um, drawbacks. And one of them is that by, by thinking of a time varying graph as essentially a graph sequence, um, you're really kind of reduced to studying graphs on a sort of slice by slice basis. Um, um, and, and these ideas of like, when does an edge or how long does an edge uh, endure across a connection uh, is, is kind of obscured from here. I mean, it's something you can get out, but uh, it's it's not always immediately apparent how to how to relate features across time. Uh, moreover, these kinds of slice by slice statistics are a little limiting. So, for example, uh, you might ask, well, what's the worst case scenario for communicating between two nodes in a in a time varying graph? Well, you might at each time shot ask, what is its diameter? So that's the the length of the longest shortest path. So every pair of nodes has a shortest path. You can see what that length is, and then you can try to maximize this across all pairs. And already kind of interestingly, when you take 80 randomly chosen Starlink satellites of the nearly 3,000 that exist uh, currently, uh, you get some already some interesting graph statistics. So the, the diameters tend to be uh, sort of bend in this somewhat bimodal distribution uh, with, with around diameter 9 as being the uh, sort of average or mean of this distribution. Uh, so that that tells you something useful. It means if you want to route across Starlink, you're on on average looking for a maximum uh, routing length of of nine. But you could end up with a worst case scenario where where you have to communicate between two really far nodes, um, and you have to take fifteen hops to to deliver that data. But nevertheless, this kind of slice by slice perspective or graph sequence perspective was really something I didn't like. Um, and I, I really wanted to get my hand on what is a time varying graph. And in the process of working with this program, um, which I'm showing you a screenshot from, this is called the uh, Satellite Orbital Analysis Program, it's SOAP for short. Uh, it actually puts out as part of its visualization, if I pick two nodes in my network, what are the windows of opportunity for talking between those two nodes? And so you get this kind of uh, collection of intervals uh, picture where you can really see that, ah, from this, let's say, window of time, if I look at, say, the yellow, yellow sort of bar, um, you know, I've got so many seconds where I can talk and then there's a break and then it comes back into view. So I, I really wanted to take this picture seriously and, and turn it into like a something a little more mathematical, something we could work with. Um, and so we decided we wanted to settle on the following definition. So uh, a time varying graph, which I'm going to call a TVG for short. Uh, at its most basic level, you can just think of as an adjacency matrix where the entries are populated by subsets of time. And so here I've got actually a demonstration with about a, a seven node network, uh, and I've actually removed um, sort of the symmetric terms, because um, right now this is, I think, from a near Earth network, possibly some involving the moon. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of duplicating who can see whom here. So I'm just looking at essentially like a lower upper triangular part. But nevertheless, you see these kind of blue barcode type structures, which essentially indicate when does that edge uh, exists. And again, that edge being indicated by the ijth entry in this matrix. Uh, 
Uh, alternatively, if, if you want to think of this in a more like, I don't know, coordinate free way, um, because, you know, matrices implicitly impose an ordering on, on your nodes, you can imagine that there's some underlying summary graph, uh, which I can call G. And if you think of this as a post set where uh, a vertex normally includes inside of an edge and this face relation post set, uh, the idea that in order for an edge to exist, both of the vertices that are doing the communication need to exist, you end up having a natural inclusion which goes from edges down to vertices. And so just because this is the Topos Institute, I felt like I had to say, uh, you can also think of a time ring graph as a, as a cellular Cauchy valued in this uh, uh, post set of, of subsets of time. But I'm going to suppress that uh, perspective for, for the remainder of the talk. So when I when I talk to engineers or I talk to like deputy managers and people are higher up in NASA, I, I need to try to convince them a little bit that this matrix perspective is, is actually a useful one. Um, probably for this audience, I don't need to do quite as much convincing, but I think it's nevertheless worth remembering why we like matrices and why they provide a different perspective on things like graphs. So as probably most of us are aware, there's this sort of classic duality between uh, simple directed graphs and Boolean matrices. And so what is a Boolean matrix? It's just a matrix where the entries are populated using either uh, true symbols, that's your, your top uh, here in green, or you have uh, your false, which is your bottom symbol uh, here uh, written in red. And so whenever there is a, a, a true uh, entry, you can just let that be known that there exists that edge in our graph. Now, why would you want to use a matrix? Well, one thing that you can do on matrices, which isn't obvious if you just think about a graph, is that you can multiply matrices. So let's go ahead and, and ask ourselves, well, if I have a Boolean matrix, does multiplication of matrices even make sense? Um, and, and I claim it does, right? So if, if I look over uh, here to the sort of bottom left where I've got A squared, I've, I've highlighted a, uh, a row vector, that top row vector, and then this fourth column vector. And I say, well, if I want to do, you know, dot product of vectors, I need to at least be able to multiply and then add entries. So does multiplication and addition make sense for, for Booleans? Yes, it does, because I can think of multiplication as my AND operator, and I can think of addition as my OR operator. And so if I run through this sort of example, row times column multiplication, I can see that Although my original matrix had a false in the one for entry, when I do this multiplication, I end up getting a true. And it's actually true in two different ways. Um, and, and what are these different ways telling you? Um, they're essentially telling you that uh, if I walk from one to two, I can then follow that true statement by another true statement, which is walking from two to four. So what this matrix multiplication is telling you is there's a length to walk from node one to node four. Now, just using Booleans, you actually lose information. So as you can all see, if you look at this graph, there's actually a second way of getting from one to four, and that involves walking from one to three and then three to four. And so if you like this idea that, okay, a matrix where I can at least add and multiply entries that sort of more formally is stated as saying, I have a matrix where my entries are in a semi-ring. So a semi-ring is just a set where there's an operation called addition and multiplication, and there are things like a zero and a one element, you don't have negatives. So, but that's okay. Right now we don't need to subtract anything. Uh, I can come up with another semi-ring that allows me to record more information. So, so uh, you might call this the path semi-ring. Uh, I also call it the name semi-ring. And what I'm gonna do is populate my adjacency matrix with uh, the names of the edges. So for example, uh, uh, I might have like one, two, as one entry, and then that's the entry that's in that entry in the matrix, and then I have two, four. If I multiply them together, I'm going to take that as path concatenation. So they they share one, two, and two, four. I can sort of collapse the common two, and that gives me a one, two, four. This is also sometimes called Latin multiplication, uh, but you should just think of it as concatenation of paths. Similarly, if I uh, look at one, three times three, four, that witnesses the path that passes through three from one to four. And if I actually just use disjoint union of these sort of names of paths as my addition operation, 
then actually I could write a different matrix that actually witnesses all those different walks between those two different nodes. Of course, when you think of a matrix, you should also think about what are vectors and what does it mean to apply uh, a matrix to a vector. The way I've written things here, it actually is more convenient to use uh, row multiplications on the left. Um, so imagine I've got a message at node one, and I've highlighted that by saying that that node is on. It's going to like try to propagate its state to nearby nodes. But it can only propagate it to nodes that it's directly adjacent to, which is, again, witnessed by this adjacency matrix, which is you know, what I'm using to represent my graph. So if I do one vector multiplication, you can see that that on state at one changes to an on state at two. And then if I apply this matrix again, you can see that now two can broadcast to everyone. That's like a really highly centrally connected node. And so then now everyone uh, outside of two is on. Now, if you go through this matrix multiplication, you'll see there's a periodic orbit that it sort of settles into. But if all you care about is witnessing where was the message and what was its sort of Boolean footprint, you might want to consider, well, let me take my row vector, which had the location of my initial broadcast, and let me apply it to this whole series of adjacency matrices and their higher powers. Uh, of course, the identity to letting you know, like, well, if I started there, then I certainly was there without having to walk at all. So in this case, we see that a message at this node eventually gets to every other node. So let's go ahead and zoom back out and look at the at the whole matrix perspective on this. So if I take my original graph and I represent it as an adjacency matrix, I could take its second power. We've just sort of convinced ourselves that I'm going to get a like two walk graph, which witnesses which ed edges or which nodes are connected via length two walks. But if I actually add these graphs together, which again is not something that's obvious with graphs, but it's obvious with matrices. You can take two matrices, you're going to add them. What you end up doing is essentially just taking the union of their edges. And so I'm going to call, at least in this example, the, the first uh, few terms in the sum of the series, uh, the, the cumulant of this adjacency matrix, which of course has an interpretation as a graph because every Boolean matrix represents a graph and vice versa. And this observation that a, a message starting at node one eventually got to all the other nodes in my network uh, is exactly the application of this row vector to uh, this now upper all on matrix. So for those of you who, who have seen this sort of thing before, um, there's this is a well-studied object, this idea of taking an adjacency matrix and studying its higher powers something called the Claney star. And there's a there's a picture of Mr. Claney right there and to the right. Uh, so he's sort of famous as a logician. He was at uh, Wisconsin's math department for many, many years. Um, and the observation was that whenever you have a matrix, let's say an n by n matrix, whose entries belong to some semi-ring, so you have an addition and multiplication operation, uh, there are pretty general conditions under which you can uh, say that this Claney star, which is this infinite series, actually exists. So meaning it kind of converges after a certain number of steps. Um, in particular, as long as you don't have uh, essentially cycles with some sort of negative weight, um, which can be made, made more precise, uh, this Claney star will actually equal the K cumulant for K uh, equal to N and higher. So n, again, is the size of this matrix. And so this, this perspective has been applied a lot to, you know, obviously Boolean matrices, uh, but also this sort of name or routing uh, semi-ring lets you know what these paths are. Uh, in this case, you can see how you, you might just keep going around in circles um, with a the, with the name uh, semi-ring. And then, of course, a lot of optimization problems, like you want to find the shortest path, uh, is equivalently treated using uh, matrices valued in this min plus uh, semi-ring, where uh, minimum is your addition operation and, and multiplication is, is your normal addition operation. All right. And essentially what, what I've just been telling you is that you can actually think of time-varying graphs as matrices valued in the semi-ring of subsets of time. 
where union is your addition and intersection is your multiplication operator. All right, so let's take this Claney star and, and like use it to start studying time varying graphs. Uh, but just to help reinforce uh, some graph theoretic properties, which I'm going to be viewing using this Claney star, uh, as, a, as a reminder, a graph is strongly connected if you can go from any node to any other node. And an equivalent way of representing a strongly connected graph or defining a strongly connected graph is it's, well, it's a Boolean matrix that when you take its Claney star, you eventually get the all true matrix, which essentially says I can go from any node to any other node. And that's a true statement via possibly some long walk. Now, of course, the shape of your network is going to dictate how tightly connected or how many hops it takes to go from one node to another node. If you start with already the complete directed graph, the Claney star converges after one step. Um, if you have, let's say, this graph on the upper right, all right, you're going to need two steps to get between any two nodes. Um, but this cycle, you're going to start needing three steps. So somehow this involves a more securitous uh, network. So I want to go ahead and, and ask, well, what kind of networks are space networks? How close are they to being strongly connected? So let's first review how does matrix multiplication work with subsets of time? And then we'll look at this uh, quantity of how does growth occur um, in terms of connectivity? So imagine I've got this time varying graph where the edge from X to Y exists from time zero to time six. And then I've also got a connection from X to Z, uh, which exists from time six to 10. Y to Z can talk from one to four o'clock. Y to W can talk from three to seven. Z to W can talk from zero to eight. Now, of course, one thing to notice right away is this matrix, uh, there's no way of directly talking from X to W. So we'd like to store that information because right now we have an empty set um, in that uh, entry for walks, but from X to W. So if we if we take the I, I plus this uh, adjacency matrix, I'm just going to call that M, take M squared, what happens? Well, so remember here, so I want to take length two walks from X to W. So if I go from X to Y, I can do that from any time between zero to six. But in order to go from Y to W, I can only do that during the hours of three to seven. So that means that the walk that uses the node Y can only happen from time three to six. And that's indicated by this first entry here. And again, all I've done is essentially take intersections and, and unions. Uh, secondly, there's another walk that goes from X to W via Z. Um, but if I take the intersection of six and 10 and zero and eight, I get six to eight. And then the union of those tells me that ah, there is actually a window of opportunity, possibly using two different paths for talking from X to W from time three to eight. And so again, the big picture here is that this cumulant, which I'm calculating here, I'm looking at the two cumulant, is like a sum over paths formula. Uh, but now what I'm doing is I'm summing up the windows of opportunity uh, for talking along those paths, assuming communication happens instantly. And again, because there is one more walk, a length three walk that goes from X to Y, and then Y to Z, and then Z to W, that actually has even more windows for, for communication because uh, when I go from X to Y and then Y to W, I have to wait till three o'clock if I want to go from Y to W directly. But if I go from Y to Z, I can start doing that immediately at one o'clock. So I have more windows for, for contact. And then similarly, then I can go from Z to W because Z to W is open for all of zero to eight. So adding in that extra term, I actually get a bigger window of communication, which is essentially this one to eight uh, time now connecting from X to W. So the real, real upshot of this entire slide is that studying higher terms in the Claney star using a matrix where the entries are subsets of time leads to a filtration over every edge. So before there was no edge from, from X to W, and that's indicated by this uh, empty set here in the lifetime growth. And then after considering length two walks, I can go three to eight, 
Or if I use length three walks, I can actually talk any time between one and eight, again, assuming instantaneous communication. So this is going to be a really interesting quantity to consider. So how does windows of opportunity grow when I start considering some of these space networks? Again, just to kind of like reinforce the intuition behind uh, how operations work in the semi-ring, if I broadcast a message at time zero using this graph, I can only go from X to Y, and that's it, because the graph slice at time zero is this disconnected graph consisting of these two edges. So in a sense, this, this TVG matrix also restricts to the graph sequence perspective, um, but it kind of forces you to think in a slightly different direction. Uh, similarly, if I send a message time one, and I, it actually is uh, sort of a farther spread because the graph slice at time one looks more connected. And then at time six, there's an even different graph slice. But, but the bottom line here is that the Claney star with entries and subsets of time models time available instantaneous walks. And it tells you what time there is for communicating between two nodes using possibly a long walk. And vector multiplication models broadcast from a particular node. So let's go ahead and, and go back to these Star League simulations. Um, and, and let me let me make some observations because the one downside is if I use Kalani's uh, result, I think this result is actually due to uh, Bernard Carré um, from the uh, 70s. You might need to take a matrix power that's up to the number of rows and columns n. Um, however, if you use this perspective that a matrix of subsets of time is essentially the same thing as a function from R that then tells you what the graph slice looks like, or the snapshot looks like, so it's a Boolean matrix. I mean, this results essentially a currying operation, but you can also check that the semi-ring operations are preserved underneath this, uh, this currying operation as well. And so what the right-hand side makes clear is that you only need to go up to whatever the diameter is at, for any given component at any given time. And so some of that statistics we did where we took 80 Starlink satellites, instead of having to take the 80th power of the adjacency matrix, because it's an 80 by 80 matrix, instead, we only have to go up to a, a 15th power because the maximum diameter at any given point in time is 15, at least empirically. It's not a general guarantee, but, but in this case, empirically tells us we only need to go up to 15. So the big upshot here is that temporal diameter ends up being much less than the number of nodes. So when we start doing these hard computations where I'm taking huge adjacency matrices, I can actually satisfy myself with taking lower powers to see how deep into the Claney star I'm going. All right, so let's go ahead and do it now. Um, all this is just cartoons. So let me show you some data. So one of the things we did is uh, we took uh, increasing samples of, of Starlink satellites. Um, in, in blue, we took just a random sample of 20 nodes, used SOAP to simulate when can one node see another. We got out of that, those that kind of like barcode looking thing, used that to create one of these matrices. And then we just started taking higher powers of this adjacency matrix, which remember, the windows of opportunity are only going to grow. So I'm going to have some sort of non-decreasing function if I look at the length of the windows of contact or opportunity. And we saw something pretty interesting, which is when we take samples of 20 or 30 nodes, there seems to be a high probability that the system kind of ends up disconnected, but also like the windows of opportunity for talking when averaged over all nodes in the network tends to behave the according to this weird kind of square root law. We have no idea what explains this curve. Like we don't know what the shape of that curve is. But once we start taking higher number of uh, nodes, like 40, 50, 70, and 100, you can start to see that this quantity, which again, the stated explicitly, I, I take each entry in my cumulant, which tells me the windows of time. I realize that that's just a bunch of intervals. So I compute its length, like its measure in R. And then I average that measure across all uh, and choose two nodes in the network. That's what these curves are showing as I take longer and longer walks. What is the time available to communicate between two nodes if I use 
the length k walk or less. So I get these kind of cumulative distributions. And, and kind of interestingly, up to 100 nodes, we almost get to full connectivity of the network. Um, in case you didn't know, there's 86,000 seconds in a day. And so you can see that actually the average lifetime between any two nodes in this 100 node network, if I use up to a length five walk, uh, is about 86,000 seconds. So, so this provides us with evidence that even with just 100 nodes uh, on Starlink, you can talk from any node to any other node, even when all these connections are coming and going. This actually led us to a conjecture, um, which you know we're still thinking about how to per precisely formulate and prove, which is that as I take more and more nodes due to essentially Euclidean geometry considerations, uh, my convergence radius for the Kleene star should be uh, approaching k equals three. So what does that mean? That means that any two nodes should be connected by a walk of length in the in the shortest a shortest walk of, of length three. Now, why is that true? Well, these satellites are about 340 miles above the surface of the Earth. So if you calculate just using Euclidean geometry, what's the viewing cone for every one of these satellites, you can figure out that it's about two times 36 degrees, so about uh, uh, 72, 73 degrees. And so if I want to talk from one satellite on the opposite side of the Earth to another one, I just need to take ideally three rotations of that because they're separated by 180 degrees. Each viewing cone is about 70 degrees and 70 times three is 210, which is more than 180. But nevertheless, there's still a lot of interesting things going on here in random graph theory oh, that's coming out of this. All right, so I wanna, I wanna provide one more sort of like advantage of this matrix perspective and, and show you some simulation work that we've done. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, long way, one way light travel is, is a key obstacle in, in, in working with space internet. Um, our traditional internet routing pro protocols like TCP IP, they rest on something called like a three-way handshake, which essentially says like sending you a message, then your receiver says, I got your message. And then it sends back another message where the original sender says, ah, I hear that you got my message. That's what this three-way handshake is. But you can imagine that if I'm trying to talk to Mars, where every one of those messages takes eight minutes to propagate, that's going to be a horribly ineffective use of, of, of bandwidth and, and space resources. Um, so we need to really understand algebraically how is propagation delay modeled and what kind of effects does this lead to uh, underneath this Kleene star perspective. So we basically cooked up a new semi ring. Um, so time is obviously given by subsets of R. But with relativity, there's kind of shifts in time. Uh, so we can model that as like an endomorphism on um, subsets of R. Uh, and actually, we'll work with a, a smaller subclass of these endomorphisms, ones which essentially are built out of two operations. Uh, if I'm like recording a message, well, first of all, I have to intersect with my window when I can actually send data. And then I can shift that window uh, based on whatever the distance is and the speed of light. And so we, we did a little simulation here where I, we have like a, I could, I could count here, uh, five, all right, 19 uh, basically nodes in this network, uh, including ground stations in Sydney and Albany. And what we did is we, we took a ping emanating from, from Sydney. And for whatever reason, when we sent the ping, none of the Starlink satellites were in view. Um, so you can see that they're only connected by a length two walk. But within about a second, it reached the moon, which on this y-axis here, you really can't even see a shift of one second. Um, so all these uh, internet advocacy group satellites uh, around the moon immediately heard the message, and then they just forwarded the message. So what, what happened then was when it forwarded the message, it broadcasted in all directions, and then it ended up hitting those Starlink satellites another second later. And so that's why those orange Starlink satellites located at near the y equals zero axis. It's actually reflecting a length two walk that was bouncing off the moon. Mars, since in this particular simulation was closer to 10 minutes away, received the first broadcast of the message about 10 minutes later. 
And then you see this sort of pinging, which is kind of like an echo across this network. And our model is able to see when certain satellites drifted in and out of view. So you'll notice that some of these other Starlinks didn't pick up on the, on the length four walk, but end up getting the message later using either a length uh, six or even eight walk or seven or eight walk. So the, the way you want to think about this, though, is that if I keep running the simulation, I keep taking higher and higher powers of the adjacency matrix, I'm going to keep seeing shifted versions of this, which essentially tells you that the Claney star never converges. Um, and and this, there's good algebraic reasons for why this is true. But I like to think of that as like one reason that space uh, routing is really difficult. All right, so, so I'm going to skip through this little history here. So uh, those of you in the applied category theory community, there's a lot of work by Jade Master and other people who have uh, talked about uh, the algebraic path problem. And this is a really rich area of, of, of research that's been, been around for at least 50 years. Um, again, Bernard Carré, who really uh, initiated a lot of this research, wrote this first paper, and he's, he's an engineer, he's not a mathematician. Um, and this book by Barras, published in 2010, has this beautiful table with, I forget what the count is, it's like over 30 different semi-rings and their uses in networking. Um, and you, you can see all sorts of different ones. Um, but the thing which surprised us was that nowhere in here was this simple subsets of R uh, as a way of modeling time-varying graphs. So although I don't really view this as really important, but it does seem like this idea of using subsets of time as a semi-ring to model time-varying graphs and to use the Claney star seems to be a novel contribution. All right, so I'm going to take the last 10 minutes or so to uh, quickly show you how we can use this perspective to then metrize the space of all possible networks um, from a space networking point of view. So I want to describe some metrics on these time-varying graphs. And again, this, this perspective of using subsets of time is actually going to give us some unique insight into this problem. So traditional parametric or time-varying graph models uh, kind of take this perspective, well, if it's not a graph sequence, it's a parametric graph. And there you can think of it as a graph where like the lengths of the edges are like springs, which if you want to represent a springy graph, then you can just use the lengths of each of the edges or whatever uh, value L1, L2, L3 is to kind of view your time-varying graph as a point, and, and in this case, R3, because there are three edges. But you can imagine if I suddenly broke one of those edges, what would I do with that point? Would I send it to zero suddenly, or would I send it off to infinity? Either way, this model kind of forces a discontinuity, especially if that edge comes back into existence. And this is exactly what happens like all the time in space routing. Um, I've got a satellite, I'm seeing it moves behind something, the edge disappears, and then it comes back into view. So it reappears. So what's What's a coordinate system where this operation is continuous? Well, again, subsets of R, but now equipped with the Hausdorff distance. Right? And so as a reminder, you know, two subsets of R or any metric space are, are sort of epsilon close. If I can thicken one by epsilon, and that contains the other and vice versa. Now, there's a really nice representation of this Hausdorff distance in the case of subsets of R. Um, and again, for reasons which might uh, seem intuitive or, or not intuitive, depending on the way you think about it, uh, it's actually better to think of these time-varied graphs and highlight when there's a disconnect. Um, so what I'm going to do is, let's say, for example, take this time-varied graph where there's just two nodes and the edge exists up until time one and then disappears and then reappears at time two. I'm going to think of that as a red interval, which I can plot on my xy axis as a scatter plot where x equals one corresponds to the start of the disconnect and the y value corresponds to the ending of the disconnect. And so all these collections of disconnect times actually lead me to a scatter plot of points. And here I've got two red points for my red TVG. Uh, I've got one orange point for this orange one. And then there's this general purpose algorithm, which uh, essentially says, how do I compare two time variant graphs? Well, I can kind of align their disconnects. Um, formally, what that means is I want to solve some sort of matching problem uh, between the disconnect times, where I can also match to the, the diagonal, which means there's no, uh, no disconnect there. 
And this is something that you can compute using a like Hungarian algorithm. And this is really inspired by, by persistence, uh, but again, not exactly persistence. So with these metrics in hand, uh, I can now formalize these statistics where I looked at the lifetime curves, which I was using as a, as a sort of indirect observation of whether or not my Starlink satellites were getting closer and closer to this strongly connected uh, time variant graph. And again, a time, strongly connected time variant graph is just a matrix with all R entries, or for a day simulation, all zero to 86,400 entries. And again, you, you do still see this kind of phase separation, at least in the in the bottleneck distance, where you just see what was the worst disconnect that I had to align. Um, and that's indicated by these blue and orange curves. There are also versions of this distance called the Wasserstein, which essentially just like means you have to pay different amounts of money to move these, these points around in this, this sort of persistence diagram uh, space. It's again, these are all kind of earth mover distances. Of course, um, I can do this sort of entry by entry, try to align these distances, which in the previous case uh, made sense. But what I ultimately want to do is try to do some machine learning that will help me separate uh, when is a network coming from something that involves, let's say, Earth and Mars satellites versus when does a network involve uh, Earth and Moon satellites. And so you can see already there, it's not clear how to just directly compare the matrices, even if they're the same number of nodes, because how do I know which moon satellite corresponds to which Mars satellite? So you have to do some sort of ranging overall in factorial uh, permutations, which is horrible. Or you do what we did is essentially say, instead of taking my time varying graph, which I can think of as like a matrix of these scatter plots indicating when disconnections occur, I could reduce to a single matrix, or I can reduce to a single scatter plot, which just looks at how do topological features evolve over time. Um, and so, for those of you who are in the TDA community, um, you'll recognize that there's this operation called zigzag persistence, which essentially studies this a zigzag of graphs and inclusions, and then it, it calculates when do holes exist, which are just empty triangles, and when do different components exist. And so this little five-step uh, zigzag graph has a, both a blue barcode, which is uh, the thing that summarizes cycles and how they endure, and also a red barcode, which summarizes connectivity. And, but now I can use this to summarize just an entire time varying graph using essentially two diagrams, a, a blue diagram and a red diagram, summarizing what are the different components and when is uh, when did these different sort of triangles of communication exist. And so what we did is we said, all right, let's take some of our uh, Starlink plus some moon satellites, run a simulation over a day, <clears throat> represent it as a time varied graph, apply zigzag persistence to get like one or one of these diagrams out. In fact, what we do is we look at the, the blue one, H1, which encodes uh, one homology across time. So just featurizing an Earth-Mars network using zigzag persistence and degree one, Let's see if we can differentiate that from a, a network where we have 15 Starlink satellites and five moon satellites. And so this is a very classic machine learning you know, mechanism. We essentially featureize in persistence diagram space. There's a metric on this, uh, exactly like the one I told you about, but we can think of it as the bottleneck distance. And then you basically take like an unknown point and you say, is this, is this the picture of a, of a Earth Moon network, or is it a picture of an Earth Mars network? And what you do is you look at your nearest neighbors in zigzag persistence diagram space, and then you reveal their class labels and you, you get an answer out. You let the majority rule. So in this case, it's a little cartoon. There seems to be more moon satellites than there are uh, Mars satellites nearby. So, so I think of this as a, as a Mars, I classify this as a, as a moon network. And this K nearest neighbors classifier actually works remarkably well, um, usually about 90% accuracy. So what this is telling you is that when you featureize these networks in persistence space, you don't even use distances, um, you can actually separate out these two different classes of networks. So that's, I think that was pretty interesting. Uh, and, and again, some of these different perspectives on how do I measure distance between networks, uh, they allow us to kind of quantify how strongly connected a time-varying graph is, 
There's also an opportunity for some control theory. Maybe we can like put this into a dynamic feedback and try to steer the network into a more, you know, strongly connected one. But then also I'd really love to identify motifs in time varying graph space. Um, and just to kind of go through some literature, like so Mason Porter and, and these uh, folks at, uh, at UCLA have done all this great work on representing like arbitrary graphs as like linear combinations of, of simple graphs. Uh, sort of uh, like a like you have a dictionary. I would love to redo this same work, but with time varying graphs. Um, and again, in these this last uh, minute or two, I just want to tell you a little bit about the future directions and and uh, hopefully pique your curiosity a little bit. So first of all, we're I'm really interested in time varying graphs that come from space simulations, um, and there's obvious periodicity there thanks to orbital mechanics. Now, I'm hopeful that if you sort of pick the right period, even with propagation delay, you could essentially work with a different semi-ring, now using subsets of the circle or the torus, depending if you're trying to use multiple systems, and then ideally prove something about convergence of the Kleene star with these different semi-rings. This also provides like a, I think a compressed representation for some of these periodic TVG matrices so that we can speed up computation of these like higher, higher powers. There's also a huge problem in, in time varying uh, graph theory, which is how do you how do you perform subnetting? How do we identify these like internet as a network of networks? Like what are the subnetworks? And so I think there's some really promising work coming out of the uh, persistent homology community. So Wu Jin Kim, uh, who's currently at Duke, uh, was PhD student of Facundo Memoli at Ohio State, has this great work on formally summarizing evolving components in a, in a labeled graph uh, using Mobius inversion, uh, which leads to this invariant that kind of looks almost like an IP address. It's like a persistence cluster gram. And so I'd be really interested in computing these things for our space networks. There's also a really, really interesting line of work uh, being carried out by Brendan Mallory, who's a PhD student at Tufts. He did his master's at Albany, uh, along with Alan Hilton at, uh, at, Garden, uh, at, at Goddard. Uh, and that's basically generalizing notions of curvature to time varying graphs. And, and as you may or may not know, like positively curved regimes are ones where you can talk to anybody and your message gets around. But in negatively curved regimes, which are like trees, there's only one line of communication between, between two nodes. And sort of uh, subnetting based on that seems promising. And then ideally, what these will do is allow us to kind of carve out the open sets or strata in the space of all time varying graphs so that we can like learn routing protocols for each one of those subnets and then glue them together using the machinery of sheaves. Uh, and again, there's a lot of uh, work on applied sheaf theory. I'll highlight uh, some work by my advisor and one of his students, uh, Hans Ries. Uh, but of course, there's this great uh, graph learning com community work uh, by Michael Bronstein at Oxford and Christian Bodner at Cambridge. Um, but again, this is just the beginning of the story, and this is part of a huge uh, multi-person project um, called the Timaeus Project. Um, and here are some of my collaborators, mostly students, um, and here are some of their contributions. And I thank you for your time. Uh, look forward to any questions you have. Thanks, Justin. Um, so yeah, there, we have time for questions, um, slightly shortened, um, but you just feel free to raise your hand in the, in the zoom or just unmute if you want to. Yeah, if there are no questions, I'm going to teach you how to cook dinner using semi rings, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to hope for questions. I, uh, I was, I had a uh, question. I was wondering, like, um, I don't know. It's not a. It's pretty, pretty open ended. But I was wondering if, like, in the, in the uh, entries of the matrix, um, whether there's room for the routing protocol itself. You mentioned for the ARPANET, everyone had their own kind of um, way that they wanted the communication to come and and be sent from them. And I yeah. thought maybe um, the actual, you know, the the protocol itself could fit in there somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So just to maybe pull this slide up. Um, yeah, so essentially, like, there seems to be like a whole uh, series of different semi rings which you can use and just kind of product together. 
and use matrices valued in, in those products and rings. Um, so right now, subsets of time is again kind of like lossy. It's sort of just a Boolean, you know, does there exist a path or not? Um, but if you start including like these routing or maybe even, yeah, so routing here is just sort of like the name semi ring, you might be able to use that to uh, one, encode what the path is. But then, I mean, ideally, we, we'd want to be able to do something like, all right, what is a, what is a routing table? Like, a, well, a shortest routing table might be, it's a, it's a shortest path tree emanating from a particular node. And so you might ask, like, how do I like, multiply trees together? And I speculate there's, you know, a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was more thinking like, um, like if, if I was going to send data, like the actual data migration, mm. uh, you know, what, what is the, you know, what, what am I going to be sending you, you ah. know, from my point of view to your point of view um, mm. across these things? It's a bit, you know, um, I was also noticing that like you seem to have a, a by category where when you take subsets of R, right? So I don't know what that, um, it looks like one has a question. Juan, do you want to just unmute and ask? Yeah, thanks. So uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your slides because they're they're beautiful. But uh, um, anyway, uh, I was thinking about uh, IPFS, mm -hmm. which you might have mentioned just before I, I got into the presentation. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I I have the, the impression that it's not quite applicable to this situation because. IPFS works as a, a like a request response model, and that's not mm. actually what's happening here, right? We already know beforehand what data we want to transfer where. Like we know that certain satellite or, or uh, robot, whatever, wants to transmit data um, that it's generating continuously. So it's different. But then my question is, do you think about some kind of modification to this semi ring that would account for caching data. So I might not have an instant in time in which I have a connection between uh, or a path between me and my destiny. Perhaps I can transmit and it, uh, the intermediate node would cache the data and then forward it later. Yeah, uh, excellent question on, on multiple fronts. Um, so, so first of all, this question of like, can I cache or store data um, is, is actually one of like the main uh, big ideas currently in, in, uh, in delay tolerant networking, DTN. Um, it goes underneath the title of like store and forward. Um, and it's basically exactly what it sounds like. Like, all right, maybe you don't have a connection, so you just store. And then when you can forward your message, you do forward it. Um, now, there turns out to be a very, very general semi-ring, which uh, we're calling the universal contact semi-ring, um, which essentially allows us to model uh, this storage and then forwarding uh, behavior. Uh, but I didn't want to get into it because it's it's kind of hairy how, how the details of it work, but uh, we're like putting the final touches on our, our first paper, which we're hoping to put on the archive in the next couple of weeks um, once it goes through some internal review. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and, and I'll add that like when I gave a 20 minute version of this talk um, at the NASA DTN face-to-face um, -face meeting, one of the things people ask is like, well, how do we actually model storage requirements on, on these like space networks? Uh, and right now it's, they, they don't really have a good idea aside from just like simulating scenarios and like treating it as like an OS and seeing how buffers grow. Um, to have like a lightweight math model where we can actually model storage requirements like using a semi ring and matrices uh, seems to be like something that's uh, uh, in demand. So, so that yeah, those because you figure the, the the spaceships have limited storage capacity. So, like, it's kind of hard, right? Because um, you have this this the the matrix multiplication would account for for like a Instant independent transmission, right? You can transmit from this node to that node or from this node to that node, but not, not the same time. And that have you thought of is there a way to account for that? Like um, for limited throughput throughput uh, ah yeah, yeah. So putting capacity flow constraint. network. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh the short answer is yes. Um there is uh, again. These, this sort of semi-ring structure seems 
I mean, they're basically categories, right? So they're very flexible. <laughs> um, uh, it turned out to, there are ways you can always engineer a semi-ring to, to seemingly model any of these behaviors. Um, uh, but the implementation in terms of actually coding up and seeing the simulations uh, is still something that's ongoing. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question and definitely where we're going. Great. So I think I'll uh, stop the quest the, the live streamed part of this now. And let's thank Justin again. Um, so uh, let me just pause the recording and.